Hello team! Welcome in the new, short and very important series of movies dedicated to ingesting data from files in the Databricks. And we are going to have a six movies, actually. Today we are going to talk about the basics of ingesting the data, like for instance, what's the difference between the stream and batch. Then we are going to talk about the DBFS, DBUTs. We will learn how to read and write a data with PySpark. We will learn how to read a data with SQL. And at the end, we are going to have a small challenge or laboratory, no matter how you call it. Basically, a couple of exercises without my help, just to practice and make check that we understand all the basic concepts. And the way it's going to work, at the beginning, in two first episodes, we are going to have a bit of theory. You can see six slides prepared by me on the left, and there are some links, so I don't count it. So, no, no, nobody likes the theory. It's not fun to listen about the theory, but believe me, it's also not fun to talk about the theory, so that it will be bare minimum. Just like learning to drive a car, at the beginning you need to, you know, get those basics. Besides that, in every episode, I'm going to open Databricks and show you some things there. And starting from the third episode, we are actually going to write the code. And here I have some examples of the things which we'll be writing. So we will be ingesting data from the different file formats we will be creating, declaring a schema, creating a tables view, global views, doing the same in SQL, you name it. We, there will be way more than this. This is just the example, just to give you a flavor how this looks like. And that's it. I hope that you will like it. So the way it works, so we have our Databricks in the middle and on the left we have our sources, like for instance, message brokers like Apache Kafka or Pubstar from Google. We have some databases like for instance, Oracle databases, or we can have some files in the cloud and those can be different type of the cloud. And usually the first thing you do, you ingest those data in the form which is very similar to what you have in the source source system. So it's almost like one to one. Then the next step, you are transforming the data. Maybe you are cleaning that, merging, joining, maybe you are aggregating, and then you are publishing that to be consumed with the SQL, Python, Power BI and, and more by uh, business users, by other systems, or of course, but by a uh, bad AI. And this whole process is represented here in very simple way. It's called extract, load and transform. And this is simplified view. In the reality, everything what is happening in the Databricks, it's more complex. You will have multiple layers. You are also going to have a simple projects represented like this, but it will not be common. Overall, in the companies, the situation looks like this. Ah, it's a small joke, haha. <laughs> and next. Something what you will frequently see on the Databricks exams, as well as on different type of the Databricks interviews, is what is the difference between the ETL and ELT. So ETL stands for Extract, Transform and Load. And this is approach which was very common long time ago. Even nowadays you are doing that, but in the very specific cases where the whole process of delivering the data was that at the beginning you were extracting the data, you were transforming, cleaning, aggregating that on the fly, and you were loading that to the target database, to the target table. The problem with that approach was that you were applying a lot of business logic in the middle, and then when the data loaded, they were already prepared for some use case. So when you wanted to use that data for other use case, for other purpose, it may not be fit anymore. So you were losing some flexibility, plus there was some there was also issue with having this process a bit expensive. So what usually you are going to see in the data engineering world is ELT. At the beginning, you are extracting the data from the source system, then you are loading that to the target system, like to the table, and then, depends on your need, you will be taking that data from the target table and you will be cleaning, aggregating and, and using that for the different purposes, but you will always have that almost one-to-one -one copy available for you of the data in your system. And in this series, we will be focusing on those two first steps. We will see how to extract a data from files and we will see how to load that to the tables, to the tables view, global temporary views and so on. We are also to, going to see how to write the data to, to the files, but that's more as a bonus. Overall, we are going to focus on those two first steps. In the next series, we will be learning how to transform a data with PySpark and SQL, but that's a completely different topic and let's keep it for later on. 
Next very important thing is the differences of how you can ingest those files, which is a topic for this series. So we can imagine a cloud storage represented by over here and some files inside. We can grab all those files at once and ingest that to our table. We can append that to our table or we can replace our table with those files. Or on the other hand, we can have a scenario that we have a cloud storage, but the files are constantly coming. So you don't have a static set of the files, but all the time you are receiving a new file, a new file with the new set of the records. So it's like a stream. So it's like constantly flowing. And we can have the approach of grabbing only the newcomers. And the name of both of those approaches, first one is called batch processing. So this means that you are taking all the files and ingesting that at once. And the second one is called streaming or incremental loading. So you have this stream of the data and you incrementally take it and append it to, to your existing system. And in this series, we'll be talking about the first scenario, so batch processing, which is way more common. The second scenario, streaming or incremental loading, that's a completely separated topic, very broad, and it's not common. You will not be doing that most likely as a data analyst or data scientist. You will be doing a second scenario mainly as a data engineer, so we park it for later. One of the things which we need to address at the beginning is the fact that you can upload the data through the user interface. If you open Databricks and you go to the catalog on the left, you have a button on the right side called Add and then Add a Data, where you can actually create or modify a table. So why to learn how to use Python or SQL to upload or to ingest the data if you can do that through this? Well, while this comes really handy, there are some significant limitations in using that. First limitation is that you can upload only 10 files up to 2 gigabytes. It can sound enough, but it's just at the beginning. In the reality, we'll have more files and those will be way bigger than 2 gigabytes. But anyway, let's hit the browser and let's upload some file. I have already some file prepared with some companies. I don't know the logic of that file. And that's how it looks like. It actually looks very simple, but it's because the file is very simple. In the reality, we'll be after ingesting some more complex file, maybe some nested JSON or even a CSV file, but instead of the comma, people will use to separate a column, so very unique character, which will not be recognized but by the Databricks, and you will hit another limitation. But anyway, let's create a table. If we don't change anything, then the table will be created in that catalog, in this schema, that will be a table name, you can change it. And then let's click Create Table. And again, if we will go to the catalog, we can look for the table in the Hive, Hive Meta Store and then in the default, in my case, and the table name was, it's this one. And we can see if everything has been uploaded properly by clicking sample data. And here it comes. It is very simple and come, can come very handy. But again, if we'll be uploading data only through this mechanism, we will not learn many cool things like what is DBFS, what is DBUtils, which may not be necessary here, but it will be necessary later on. It's really cool. And it will be also necessary for the Databricks certification, period. The last thing we should talk about in the episode dedicated for the basics is a different file format supported by the Databricks. And actually there is a Plendora, different file formats supported by the Databricks. We will not go through all of them, but just to give you some flavor. And also once you will see different type formats in the Databricks documentation, you will know what it means. So first one is of course CSV, comma separated values, and I'm a big enemy of the CSV. And that's how it looks like. I think everyone knows. Usually it should be, the columns usually should be separated by the comma, but life is not so easy and people are using really a wild characters to separate the columns, which later on makes it a bit more tricky to read. Then we have JSON, also very popular. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Oriented Notation. And that's how it looks like. It's in the form of the dictionary. So you will always, you will always have a key, like in this case, device ID and the value, key and the value, and so on. The values can be also a list, so it can be nested. And then we have Parquet, and I'm a big fan of Parquet. Parquet is a binary format, which means that you cannot simply display its contents, which is disadvantage comparing to the CSV. But on the other hand, it's more bulletproof 
it's f way faster than the CSV and takes way less space on the hard drive than the CSV, which sometimes is a big deal. And Parquet are having at the end the word Parquet. And then the fourth, the fourth format, which we will not be discussing here because it's a broad topic. It's something what is really big in the Databricks world. It's called Delta format. Basically what it is, it's, you can think about it is as a Parquet on steroids. It's a set of the Parquet's file with additional log called Delta log, which is tracking a changes to the data set to the file you are creating. So whenever you are adding new data to the Parquet file or modifying existing one or deleting, then it's everything is being registered in that log, which we'll be learning on later on, which, accel which significantly accelerate the process of you looking for the information in the Parquet files and support the assets transaction, which again is a bit of different topic. It's really for the purpose of when whenever you will see that in the database documentation, you will know what it means. And that's it when it's going about this episode. In the next one, we will talk about the DBFS, where again, there will be a bit of theory, and then we are going to see actually how the DBFS looks like and how it works. Cheers.